It's my dad's birthday today, by the way. Um, and I'm so grateful for him because he stood behind me. And even when others doubted me, my mom and dad always taught me that there's nothing you can't do as long as God is behind you. And I'm so grateful for my heritage. And I started thinking about, it was 10 years ago next month that I showed up in a million. I was messed up. I was jacked up. Who am I kidding? I'm still messed up and I'm still jacked up. Had no business pastoring. I mean, in, in most people's eyes, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm ashamed to say how messed up I really was. But there was a small group of about 10 people when I got here that put their arms around me and loved on me. And I think 10 years ago, where I was, and how no one should even be listening to anything I had to say, but all I knew was the presence of God just kept driving me. And the last 10 years has been a journey. I've questioned everything. I've questioned everything I've ever believed. I've questioned every part of Scripture. I wanted to make sure what I believed was God or was it man-made. Now, I'm, I'm not the greatest pastor by any means, and I'm not even remotely a good speaker, but I will say one thing, that when you come here, I want you to leave equipped with knowledge that you may not have had when you walk out that door. Your life should always change when you get in the presence of God. If we come to church, your life should change, and you should change, help others change with your testimony, with your worship. But more than anything, can I tell you, I love our music, and I know we're missing... A couple people, but I, I think they do an amazing job. I really do. And if you don't believe me, just ask Preston. He will tell you. But, you know, music doesn't change you. It will inspire you. But the only thing that really changes anything is the Word of God. And today I want to show you what I've learned. I'm in the middle of James, in the middle of a series James is the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, 35,000 people under persecution. They have some trials. Everybody, he had some trials, right? And he is the half-brother of Jesus. So not only is he a disciple, but he's got a great insight into the Son of God. And he lays out right off James chapter 1, verse 1 through, James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, he lays out five. Everybody say five. Five, five things that you need to have to overcome your trials. If you're having a hard life or having a hard time in life, you must first identify what's, what's hindering you, what's holding you back. And hard times are usually th one of three things, trials, temptations, and tests. A temptation, if you identify what you're going through, you'll know how to fight it. God. Not to reveal to God who you are, but to reveal to yourself your strength and your weaknesses. God does allow and send some tests. Number two is temptation. That's what the enemy will tempt you with. Uh, excuse me. The enemy will use temptation. Temptations comes from your own desires. You, prime example, addictions. The enemy uses addictions, attempt, tempts you with addictions, or maybe it's lust, whatever it may be, your own desires. What I'm talking about now is a trial that comes from the enemy, and we all go through it. We all go through it. The reason why we go through it is because what's locked up inside of you is so great that it can literally change your community. What's locked up inside of you will change your family. It's a fight, and I want to tell you anything worth having in life is you have to fight for it. Can I hear an amen? You've got to fight for it. I, don't, I just felt the Holy Spirit. I've got to keep on saying it right now. You've got to fight for it. If it's easy, I want to tell you, it's not God's best. I promise you. If something is easy, it's not God's best. Uh, it, it's all right to have those things. I need some easy layups once in a while. You know what I'm talking about? You ever go through so much, you looked up God, and you say, God, throw me a bone? But the thing that is amazing in your life will never come easy. And just because you face persecution doesn't mean that you need to give up. The biggest thing I tell everybody all the time, they, people say, well, it's not God or it would go easy, honey. If it's God, it's not going to go easy because the gates of hell is going to come against you to stop what's coming out of you. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's equipped you. He's called you. He's ordained you for something great. And the enemy's job is to knock you down and beat you down and give you trials, tribulations, and temptations. But if you do the five things that James laid out, 
you're going to come out the other side. God brought you to it, and he's going to bring you through it in Jesus' name. So I'm going to read it because I'm already five minutes over because those pretty little kids took my time. This is a letter from James, a slave of God and, the, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. I talked about that last week. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, not when, not if, it's when, consider it an opportunity for great joy. So the first week we talked about understanding what joy is. It's not an emotion. It's not from circumstances. It's not external. It's internal. I can't keep going. I got to keep going. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Verse 4. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I talked from the NKJV last week. It's talking about patience was the second thing. Anybody been tried on patience this week besides me? Now, number three. Today, we're going to talk about when I read, when I point to you, I want you to yell it out, say it out, cry it out, shake it out, whatever you got to do. If you need, what's that word again? Ask our generous God and he will give it to you. Paul's right there. Ask your, gen- so the third thing that I've got to have, if I'm going to get through my trial if I'm going to get through my tribulation, if I'm going to get through my issues, is wisdom. And not just any given wisdom. I need God-given wisdom. I have some wise people in my life, and I ask them for advice. Matter of fact, this Thursday, I'm going to meet with one of my mentors, and I couldn't find any glasses and readers, and I have three in my front pocket right now. (laughs) There is a spirit of multiplication that just came up on this church. (laughs) Quick, grab my wallet. I need God wisdom. I am going to meet with my mentor this week, and he's going to give me his wisdom. But his wisdom can only come and go so far. You can ask me for my wisdom. (laughs) I don't know why you would. But my knowledge and my wisdom and my advice is only going to go so far. Why? Because I don't know how you're made. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know what's coming around the corner. I don't know what people are in your life. But there is, so so my wisdom can only go so far. A pastor's wisdom can only go so far. But there is an almighty creator that created the heavens and the earth. He created the sun and the stars. And with his very finger, he put this big round ball called earth into orbit and started spinning it. And I believe he carved out every ounce, every river, every valley, and every canyon. He created every mountain. He created all of the beautiful things that we see. I don't want my wisdom. I want God's wisdom on that because he's the one that guided me, uh, that, 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 that created me, that called me, that made me who I am. He knew me before I was even born in this world. Why would I want anybody else's wisdom but the wisdom of God? Yeah, I'm glad to <laughs> So what is godly wisdom? It's simply this. Looking at your trial through God's perspective, then applying Bible. That, looking at what you're going through, through God's perspective, and then applying his word. For example, anybody ever lose a job? Anybody losing one right now? Okay, I was just asking because I don't want to raise my hand because I work for you guys. <laughs> Unless you all know something I don't know, I'm safe. But then again, who would, all, who would want to come? Never mind. Who would want my job? If you lose your job today, if you look at it through your perspective, what you're going to be, see is lack. You're going to see worry. You're going to see anxiety. If you lose a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, somebody walks out on you, what do you see? You see loneliness. You see betrayal. It could go on and on and on. I, and, and, you know, so I don't want to look at it through my perspective. And sometimes I don't want to look at it through somebody else's perspective. Let me tell you what happens. Hurt my child hurt my child, have my son, I love it when, you know, uh, uh, 
I love it when one of my kids come to me and they tell me all the mean things the big bad bullies did at school. You know what I want to do? Oh, it's from my perspective. I'm going to go up there and give somebody a piece of my mind. Then I realized I can't give away anymore if I need it. Some of you need to stop giving everybody a piece of your mind. You don't have much left. I can look it through my perspective and my son's perspective or my daughter's perspective and we'll see something that may not be true or we'll see, we'll see this, we'll see that. I want God's perspective. Going back, if I lose my job, I'm, my perspective is that I'm going to go without. But God's perspective, when he looks at that trial, he sees that he moved you. You just got moved out of something that wasn't yours anyway. Now he can give you what he needs to give you. God's perspective is different than your perspective. And your perspective is hate and anger and happiness and all of those different things. But God's perspective, he knew what you did before. He knows what you're doing and he knows what's in front of you. I want the perspective of God. So if I lose my job today, I want his perspective. It's the fact that he's getting ready to be my provider, show up and show off and do better. I want his perspective on the fact that I'm going to believe that he's going to show up and take care of my needs, take care of all of these things as I keep doing the right thing, looking through God's perspective and then applying biblical principles. That's godly wisdom. Let me give you another example. Oh, I'm going to just... We're in, hmm. I, 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 I love it when people are in relationships that they're miserable in. Don't look at me like that. And then all of a sudden, that person walks out on you, whether it be a husband, a wife, or friends, or whatever, and that thorn is moved. If you take on your perspective, you'll go try to drag back what was just taken away. God's perspective, oh, let me, from your perspective, if you don't, if you don't look it through his perspective and then change your behavior by godly principles, you'll have the same old devil in your life again, just a different name. Come on. Come on. If you're broke today and you've got uh, $30,000 of credit card debt, oh, and you get another chance, if you don't look it through God's perspective and apply biblical principles, I don't care if you get your credit cards paid off today or not, they'll be back to $30,000 within a year if you don't change biblical principles. So wisdom that this is talking about is God-given perspective and then you're implemented God-given solutions. Can I tell you the difference between wisdom and prudence? You know what? You ever heard the word prudent? Am I that old? <laughs> Wisdom is knowing what to do. Prudence is knowing when to do it. So I want God's wisdom because he tells me what and how and the prudence of God of when to do it. Now, all right. So I have this thing called a phone. I know it's so amazing. Everybody, everybody got one? Anybody have those 800 numbers pop up all the time? They're telemarketers. And then they act like, you know what makes me mad now? At least if you're going to call me, be on the phone when I answer. Instead of have a robot saying, would you please hold? We have an important message for you. Yeah, I've got one too, but I can't repeat the message that I gave it. Now, now, here's the thing. People try to sell me things all the time. People try to sell me things all the time. And there's always a better product. There's always a better product. So I'm willing to buy something else and change things. But the first thing I want to do is saying, what does your product have that mine doesn't? What, does you, what can it do that mine doesn't? So I want to tell you about the wisdom of God because it brings seven benefits. Everybody say seven. So I want to know how to get the bit. What are the benefits? Because I could sit here and say, do it God's way instead of your way. And you're like, okay, that sounds good. Why? Well, here's why. Number one, are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, uh, you were so excited to be here today. <laughs> Woo! I sound like Ric Flair. Number one, godly wisdom brings stability in unstable times. Let me say that again. 
God's wisdom will bring stability in unstable times. Can I, can I, can I tell you, look at Isaiah 33, 6. Isaiah 33, 6. And there shall be stability in your times. Everybody say, that's me. All right. And abundant salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. I want to point something out. Wisdom is part of the foundation and the bedrock of stability. This world is unstable. If you don't believe it, we don't even know officially who's running for president of the United States. And that's not a political statement. It's the truth. It's unstable. If you don't believe it's unstable, look at your inflation. Your money can't be counted on. You could have a trillion dollars, but it may not be, you may not even be able to buy a trillion dollars worth of stuff. It's unstable. Stability. Kids, they tell me that kids need, and I'm learning this all over again because apparently, every, by the way, half this children's church was in my house last night. I went to bed. I'm not going to tell you what time I went to bed last night. It was early. And I got up this morning, and I'm walking through the house, and all of a sudden I, I see Kylie's room, and I hear a lot of noise, and I open the door. I'm like, there's an extra three of you. Where did you come from? But they tell me raising kids, stability and structure for them to be healthy. Teenagers, stability and structure. Husbands, <laughs> we need stability and structure. Can I hear an amen, ladies? Amen. Stability and structure. So the first thing that you got to do, besides having joy and patience to get out of your trouble, if you're in a cycle going like this, anybody ever feel like they've been in a washing machine? <laughs> oh, Lord, my whole life's a washing machine. I can tell you everything. There's no one set thing that you need, but one thing that you've got to do is you've got to bring stability back to your life and stop being like this. God cannot touch in you. <laughs> stability. Yes, faith. Yes, all of those things. But you have to get stability. And how do I get stability? Godly wisdom. Looking at what I'm going through from his perspective and applying scripture. The Bible says that when you build your life on Jesus Christ, you're built on a rock. If you don't build your life on Jesus Christ, your life is built on sand and it shifts and you could build a great, big, expensive life today, but if you don't get stability through your creator, it could be gone tomorrow. However, when you build your life on godly wisdom, the world can take everything you have away, but he, they cannot take your creator, your redeemer, and what you lost yesterday, God can turn around and give it back to you tomorrow. Stability. Stability. Some of you right now need to get rid of unstable issues in your life. Oh, I, this is not where I needed to go with this. Well, I wanted to go. It's where I need to go. How about that? And I know this is God right now. And I just got another six or seven minutes. But the wisdom of God, his perspective, doing it his way, brings stability to your life. This is a word so pointed that I know is from God right now. And I don't say this very often, but heed what I'm saying. Stop the roller coaster. Save your drama for your mama. Come, you with me? Stop it. Most of us, including myself in the past, I don't know how to operate unless there's chaos. And as long as there, do you know before Jesus did miracles, the first thing that he did? He brought order. When he was getting ready to feed the thousands with fishes and loaves, he set them down and brought order. Your life, God wants to do something great in, but you have got to bring order to it. And that comes from the wisdom of God Almighty. Number two, I got to go quick. 
I've got, ooh, number two. Everybody say number two. Wisdom, godly wisdom, helps me win battles. Look at Isaiah 33. And there shall be stability. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong one. Oh, yeah. One of those three pair of glasses, they work. Ecclesiastes 9.15. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Stability brings victory. Number three, wisdom keeps us, oh, Lord. Godly wisdom keeps us from living in our past. Can I hear it? Amen. This is not too happy. Ecclesiastics 8.1. I'm teaching today instead of preaching. Who is like a wise man. Nope, that's not it. 710. Nope. nope. Yep, 710. There we go. Do not say, oh, oh, here we go. Why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. So wisdom will keep you from living in the past. In other words, let me help you. You know what this says? The good old days weren't as good as you remember them. Wisdom is remembering the past, but not living in the past. Godly wisdom. Listen, God can't do anything about where you came from. You already done it. You already done done it. You already done, 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 done it. He can't, his wisdom can't fix your past, but it can fix your present and your future. Godly wisdom never tells you the past was better. Progression with God means you're going to go from victory to victory. What about the valleys? I don't want to, I'm going to go through the valley, but I'm heading towards the mountaintop. You hear me? I, my future is better than my past. My life is not over. My life is not, come on, you with me? Yeah, I remember the days of when my daddy, when he first started pastoring, we had this church and I remember, oh my, if I could just go back. I remember my grandpa singing, my great grandmother and my great grandfather and my great, great, great aunt. I could tell you about it. It's a little tiny church. Didn't have any, it didn't even have any installation in it. It's seated 40. You had to go back about, about three to five miles back, an old dirt road and gravel road. We didn't have plumbing. We didn't have HVAC. We had none of that. We had an old coal fire stove in the corner. That's how I grew up in the beginning. And I can remember, and I used to think, man, it would be nice just to go on back. We'd go back there. But then I start looking around. If I spend three hours without air conditioning now, <laughs> can I hear an Amen. I had no water. Church services be three, three and a half hours. You know what I'd have to do as a kid? I prayed for thunderstorm rain. I would go outside, and if I heard like anything, I'd go out there and just open my mouth. Lord, bless me. <laughs> what am I saying? The memories are fond, but I wouldn't go back there. I wouldn't go back there. I don't want to live in my past. I never want to pay those prices again. I want to go forward. Wisdom of God keeps you moving forward instead of looking at your past. Number four, I'm going to go quick. You don't have to read the scriptures. Wisdom gives me boldness. Number five, wisdom gives me an abundant life. And number six, wisdom gives me direction in times of adversity and prosperity. And then wisdom brings riches and wealth. I want to point something. I want to show you one more scripture, then we're going to go home. I don't preach over 30 minutes. They took my time. I'm up 27 right now. Look at the 77th Psalm. And this scripture excites me. It's talking about the children of Israel being led out of bondage into the promised land. And instead of taking the easy way, God brought them up to the Red Sea. Anybody remember that? And they had Pharaoh coming at them from the back. They could see the idea of the promised land just on the other side. And they thought they were going to perish. But this is what Dave said. David said, your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. The wisdom of God 
when you're looking for a man-made idea and advice and please have mentors come talk to me. But in the end, I don't know where you're going. God does. Amen. And you may think that you're up against the biggest obstacle of your life. You may be diagnosed with, with a disease. You may be on the brink of losing everything you have. You may be at your last wit. And you may, know, you may not know the answer. You may be in despair. The wisdom of God, he will give you an answer and a path that doesn't even seem possible. No one dreamed that God would part the Red Sea. Most of them would have never got up there if God was going to say, there's your path. I would be saying, God, I would need a bridge before I go. Amen. Come on, you with me? But then when we get up to that obstacle and we think there is no way, you be patient and wait upon the Lord and don't stop believing, keeping it stable, believing the promises of God. Keep looking through God's perspective and there will be a path that will open up that no one even dreamed. If you would have told me 10 years ago, I'd be standing here in front of you. I had no idea. It looked like my past was insurmountable. I was living in my past. I could keep going on and on and on. But when God rolls the water back, you're going to see the miraculous happen. Don't stop trusting the wisdom of God. Amen. There's a path that you don't see. There's an answer that no one else sees. But I'm telling you, it's there. Let's all be standing. Prayer team, if you would come forward, if you need to pray for any reason, if you're sick and afflicted, we would love to pray with you. If you just need answers, I'm, I don't know if I have the answers, but I know the one that does. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is the perfect time. You may say, what does that entail? You know what it simply means? Are you ready to start having Jesus with you? Do you want a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I'm not ready to join a church. I didn't ask you to join a church. I'm just asking you to join the body of Christ. How do I do that? I'm glad you ask. It's simply, you know what? I'm going to do it this way. Acknowledge that God, you believe in God. You may say, well, I have doubt. I didn't ask you if you have doubt. Faith requires doubt, believe it or not. Without doubt, there would be no need of faith. So I choose today to acknowledge God. Would you do that with me? Say, God, I believe in you. I know I have doubts, but I choose today to believe. Number two, the Bible says that we're all appointed to die because we have sin in our lives. But the reason why Jesus came was to pay the price for your sins and who you are. So the Bible says if you believe in God, that God had a son named Jesus, and that Jesus died upon a cross for you and rose again the third day, and you choose to believe that, you're almost saved. You ready? God, I believe in you. I believe that your son, Jesus, died for me and rose again. Then the scripture tells me, that if I confess him as Lord and Savior, he will save me. Think about it. It can't be that simple. Why would he make it complicated? I love my kids. Uh, I love him. I really love you right now because you cut off your hair. If I love her, when I say it's dinner time, Come on up. I've got something prepared for you. She don't have to make a bunch of dinner reservations and take a class and orientation of how to hold a spoon. Said, come on, old. She just has to simply get up, leave the basement, come upstairs and just sit down at the table. It's the way salvation is. We've overcomplicated it. We think we've got to have this class and that class and this and this certificate. You know, those things are wonderful, but they have nothing to do with your hope in Jesus. So today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if you've never prayed it, even if you have prayed it, and you're ready to rededicate your life, I believe that God's doing something special and unique today. I normally don't take this much time to do this, but today I really believe there are some folks that really need God moving in their life. I promise you, 
This may not give you the big breakthrough this very second, but the power of the Holy Spirit guiding you and directing you that's going to come in your life, you want to get through what you're going through with the help of Jesus Christ and the right decisions. Amen. Say, God, I believe in you. I believe in your son who died upon that cross and rose again. I know that was for me. This moment, I confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. This very moment, I choose to be born again. This very moment, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm going to keep going. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, give God a hand clap of praise.